Looking down. Perfect. Welcome everyone to The Dig. I'm really excited tonight because I started the whole series. I still can't believe we started back in June. And here we are on the 14th of the 15 in the series. And I'm going to be talking about Marion and, Della, uh, Marion and Della Knuckles tonight, which I'm really excited because the last 72 hours, I received a massive data dump. Uh, from the Schubert Theater, from the Court Theater in New York City. We actually have a live recording from 1922 when Della Knuckles was on the stage in New York at the Court Theater. So um, um, before we start, um, uh, one, the real reason that we started this whole series was coming out of COVID, we were looking at different ways that we could um, kind of look at the recovery. And the one thing that we knew that we could do would be to break bread and to share stories. And that has been so true throughout this whole series. And I look back, and if you haven't already, all of the videos are available on YouTube. And we'll be sending out some emails shortly to all of those who have attended. And we have some big announcements next week, which is the last in the series. And um, we actually are gonna do two drawings. And the drawings are gonna be for two uh, pairs of tickets for the entire series next year. And I think, as I mentioned last week, I've already received 72 requests for different speakers. So clearly that's way too many for next year. But what we're doing next year is we're taking the dig on the road. And we're right now about to start a working group. So if you're interested in helping us choose the four neighborhoods for next year, we're going to go to four different neighborhoods. We've already chose the east side, Bessemer, and certain areas we haven't decided yet for the other two, but we're going to do four consecutive Wednesdays, and we're going to work with those communities in putting together the presentations for each. So we'll have 16 in the main series, but we may do two special editions. Uh, one really important thing that we just did recently is we met with the Youth Documentary Academy which was founded um, about a decade ago in Colorado Springs. And these are young filmmakers. And if you've been watching Rocky Mountain PBS, and in fact, PBS nationally, they have bought this series. And it's on Thursday nights. And it is amazing. These are short films done by young filmmakers. And um, they're everything from PTSD to suicide to hair to, I mean, everything you can imagine. There's about 100 different episodes that they put together. They're now airing every Thursday on Rocky Mountain PBS. But we're looking at combining forces. So the dig, we're thinking about taking over Memorial Hall one evening and doing four of these youth documentaries and then doing something about the history of Memorial Hall, which in its own right is rather extraordinary. It's where Woodrow Wilson gave his last public address, collapsed, and never gave a, pre a presentation, a talk, anything in public until his death. So there's some really interesting stories. And he was here to ratify the Versailles Treaty um, when he collapsed on the stage. So um, I have a lot of information tonight. And we're going to go through these slides. And I'm very uh, hopeful because there is a team and others who are doing research on Marion and Della Knuckles. And we're looking to do a full feature film on this particular subject that I'm going to talk about tonight. So um, here we go. Marion and Della Knuckles. So what we're going to cover today, just to give you kind of an overview, 
is we're going to look at the Knuckles family just briefly. I really want to concentrate on these two women, and I'm going to give you some detours. So I leave out the husbands, although I'm going to give you a little bit of information because some of them were extraordinary, but we're really going to focus on the real story, which is Marion and Della, these two sisters, and it really is the story of the sisters. So we're going to look at the Knuckles family. We're going to look at the early years growing up in Pueblo. We're going to look at Della and her love for dance. We're going to look at Marion and her love for arts and business. Then it's really an interesting sister leadership and the death of their father. And then we're going to end with World War II and the end of three generations of leadership. There's a very interesting book. I actually have a copy of it. This is The Roses, The Knuckles Family, The Lyman Family, and 150 immigrants who helped shape America. So the knuckles go back a long way. And I'm going to read just a really interesting passage because I think it frames a lot of what is so fascinating about this particular family. Um, knuckles and the Roses. When people named Knuckles or Knuckles immigrated to America in the early mid 1650s, they brought a white rose bush. As the Knuckles children married and moved to establish their own home, they took roots from the original bush and planted it. From these rose bushes, their descendants continued the tradition, taking roots to their new homes. After 200 years, several members of the family still had the family white rose when their great unpleasantness between the states and the migration west disrupted the tradition. Somewhere in southwestern Virginia, the old white rose still exists. The Knuckles verbal tradition is that the Knuckles family suffered terribly during the War of the Roses, 1455 to 1487, and had lost their land and title as a result of the war. The War of the Roses was a war between families, really cousins, for the power to rule England the White Rose of the House of York and the Red Rose of the House of Lancaster were emblems worn with great pride, just as the forces of the South wore gray and the Union forces wore blue during the American Civil War. Uh, this book recently came out. This is by Charles R. Knuckles Jr. He actually lives in Texas, and there is a whole chapter in here on the Pueblo story in particular, especially meatpacking. So 1899, let's start there. Della Knuckles was born January 18th in 1899 in Pueblo, Colorado. She was educated at Pueblo schools and graduated from Central High School. So all those Central grads, uh, Della is one of your alums. Uh, she studied contemporary dance at Denishon School of Dance in Los Angeles. She performed on Broadway in New York City. She married Alexander L. Jones in Phoenix in February of 1933, and then Della assumes the role of president of Knuckles in 1943, and Della dies in 1980. So this is just an overview, and um, we're gonna go into all the meat of all of these parts of their stories. Then in 1902, uh, Della's younger sister, Marion, is born. So she was born on February 15, 1902, in Pueblo, Colorado. She was educated at Pueblo Public Schools and also graduated from Central High School. She's a longtime student of and assistant to Frances Schwinger. And we'll get into that a little bit. It's rather controversial and really tragic. Um, she was a top musical artist in the state of Colorado and throughout the United States. She was appointed president of the Knuckles Packing Company. She married Frances Swinger on May of 1933. She remarried to Alfred A. Williams in San Jose, California in June of 1944. And then Marion dies tragically in 1949. And I think I've mentioned before, and if you've been on the tours at Water Tower Place, I work with the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of the Knuckles family and also of Hans Peter Henschen, the Norwegian who designed the Knuckles packing plant. 
and they have been really extraordinary and helpful. So let's take a look at Della. Della Vanna Knuckles. This is one of my favorite pictures, and we'll get into some more amazing pictures. But Della was a Denishon dancer. And this is really an important, for those of you that understand or have studied or are fans of dance, especially aesthetic contemporary dance, these two were really the world leaders at their time. So at the turn of the 20th century, Ruth St. Dennis was a popular vaudeville performer and veteran of several David Belasco theatrical productions. In 1910, in need of a male dance partner for her act, St. Dennis auditioned and admiring Ted Sean, and modern dance history was positioned to be made. The couple married in 1914 and in 1915 founded Dennis Sean, a dance school and performing arts company in Los Angeles. In its day, Dennis Sean was synonymous with dance in America. Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey, Charles Weedman, and Joe, Jose Limon were just a few of the dancers who began their careers with Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean. During the 20s, the two dancers and the Dennis Sean company appeared in the famed Zigfield Follies, both on Broadway and on national tours. From August 1925 to November 26, the company embarked on a triumphant tour of Asia. I just received this photo, which is amazing. These are the Denishon dancers, and this was in Los Angeles, and this is on one of the beaches out by Santa Monica. And um, this is Martha Graham. So if you know contemporary dance, Martha Graham is one of the most famous dancers. This is Della right here. And I was just blown away that we actually found this particular picture. Just to give you an idea, they were extraordinary. Just think, this is in the early 1900s. Um, and they were really avant-garde. They were very much about the aesthetic of contemporary dance. They were really just kind of on a pathway of their own. I can't believe I found this too. This is actually Della. And um, let me go, I think I skipped one. Let me just go back real quick. There we go. Um, the Greenwich Village Follies. So the way that Della got involved, she was with the Denishon dancers, and of course, they were just so extraordinary in what they were doing in Los Angeles. And the dancers were really talented, very, very talented, many in classical ballet, and then went into other forms of dance. But what happened was, is there were a lot of traveling companies. And the Greenwich Village Follies, there was the Zigfield Follies, and then there was the Greenwich Village Follies. And the Greenwich Village Follies was a musical review that played for eight seasons in New York City from 1919 to 1927. Launched by John Murray Anderson and opening on July 15, 1919 at the newly constructed Greenwich Village Theater near Christopher Street, the show's success has been credited in its part to its timing. And it was a non-union production. And it was unaffected by the then current actor strike. And in the fourth year, the show moved to the Schubert Theater. And so this is where we find Della in 1922. So she performed from September 12th to March 10th and this was an original music review. It opened on September 12th, as I said, March 10th, 209 performances. I started to dig further, and so Della, she was in the Greenwich Village Follies in 1925, and these are all of the different playbills. She did lots of different um, acts. And then, of course, this was her first real Play. It was an original play, a romantic comedy, and it was called Love It Like That at the beautiful Court Theater. And Della played the maid in this particular production. And the, um, the producer of this play was Alexander Jones. So I don't know where Della met her first husband, Alexander Jones, but again, I'm not going to talk much about the husbands, but... 
Alexander Jones was an extraordinary Hollywood producer. These are all of his plays that he produced. And he an amazing obituary in the New York Times. So he died in 1943. They married in 1933, and he died in 1943. He, had, he was in really bad health, and he was in a hospital in San Diego for about a year, and then moved to Phoenix, where his sister lived. But I'm going to just read his obituary, because um, it does give you a little bit of information, and it also sheds some light on what Della's life was like in this very theatrical family. So um, Alexander L. Lewis, head of a New York ticket agency and a former theatrical producer, died early today at the nearby Desert Grove Ranch of his sister, Miss Nora E. Jones. He was 63. Mr. Jones, long a sufferer from pulmonary tuberculosis, came here a week ago to spend the winter at the ranch. He was in San Diego Hospital for more than a year. Besides his sister, he leaves a widow, Mrs. Della Vanna Jones, now in Pueblo, Colorado, and a daughter, Mrs. George Elwell of Brooklyn, New York, the former Emily Louise Jones. Mr. Jones, president of the Broadway Theater Ticket Corporation, 218 West 42nd Street, was born in Kansas and was a prominent Broadway producer and theater ticket produce, broker for more than 35 years. After attending the School of Mines at Columbia University, he became interested in the same theater tickets and for many years thereafter was associated in that field with Joe LeBlanc, very well known, very, no, very well known at that time. He first became active as a producer in collaboration with John Court, the Court Theater. They produced Scandals, Fiddler's Three, and Flow Flow. Mr. Jones and Morris Green, directors of Bohemians, Inc., produced the first of the Greenwich Follies in 1919. So you can see how Del got part of that whole production, and that's how she met Alexander Jones. Um, Mr. Jones was producer of the comedy Shine, which starred Joe Cook, the squaw, in which Clark Gable had a minor role, and S. N. Behrman's play Brief Moment. In 1931, he and Morris Green took their production Louder Please to Sing Sing for a special performance. It's amazing they use the word sing sing. Um, it was the first outside production given on the new Sing Sing stage and was witnessed by more than 1,800 prisoners. So that's Alexander Jones, but it gives you an idea. And of course, um, Della, that I can see so far, only did one major uh, production, which is Love is Like That, which ran from April 18th, 1927. I don't have the exact date. Um, um, let's look at Marion now. Um, Marion Knuckles was really an amazing Pueblo society girl. I mean, she was extraordinary in her talents. And I came across um, this really fascinating, the Pueblo Chieftain is one of our great at re greatest resources. And the digital archives really give us a lot of information. But um, this was from the early 1920s. Um, but Miss Knuckles, uh, Miss Mary Knuckles, pianist, pupil of the Schwinger School of Music. So you can probably remember I mentioned the Schwinger name before. Um, Francis Schwinger was a child prodigy. He, originally, the family came from Hungary, came to the United States, and he formed the Pueblo Schwinger School of Music, which was world famous. And you can literally pull up just Schwinger or Schwinger School of Music, and almost every edition of the Chieftain, whether weekly or daily, has something about that school, whether it was an advertisement or whether it was a recital, whether it was a benefit. But Miss Marion Knuckles, pianist, pupil of the Schwinger School of Music, who is to be a contestant of the 1923 contest of the National Federation of Music Clubs in Colorado, will appear at a free recital in Memorial Hall, Sunday afternoon at 2.30 o'clock. Miss Knuckles is the youngest daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Harvey Knuckles of the city. 
She has been a student of the piano for a number of years and is considered one of the most accomplished musicians in the state. Miss Knuckles, who is a prominent in social circles in Pueblo, was a student at Central High School. During that time, she appeared in numerous school recitals and playlets. What I love about this article is it talks about Della, too. Her elder sister, Della, Miss Della Knuckles, is an exponent of aesthetic dancing, having studied for some time under the direction of Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean in the Dennis Sean School. She has appeared in concerts in this city on two occasions. The other ad over here, um, I found this quite a bit. Um, competitions were huge in Pueblo. It was a real center for the performing arts. And because the Francis uh, Schwinger School of Music was based here and headquartered here, people came to learn, to study, to train. And I noticed that, and if you look at this here, um, I've highlighted Marion Knuckles. She assisted, this was in 1923, she assisted him in her early, early years. So clearly, she had extraordinary talent, not only as a musician, but she had this real business prowess, which is going to really come into play uh, when she takes on a more powerful role just in a few years. So this is another amazing story that I was studying separately, and I knew, I did not know that there was even a connection between the Knuckles family and the great opera house. So Louis Sullivan built the opera house, which was at 4th and Main, right here in downtown Pueblo. Um, Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, was his junior draftsman. And two parts of this building are attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright. And if you look at this design, if you know Frank Lloyd Wright, he is accredited with doing that tower. But inside the theater, the theater, it was the first in the United States, it had a mezzanine with no buttress supports. So if you've studied or if you've heard about Frank Lloyd Wright and his modernist homes, he does some amazing things with his engineering. So it's an amazing thing. But sadly, I'll show you the opening. This is the opening play inside the theater at the Opera House. It was an extraordinary, I mean, these are the sets that they had in the Opera House. But one year after the flood, so we've all been going through the 100th anniversary of the flood and how tragic that was. Well, just go one year later, March of 1922, the annual grocer's ball was taking place on the third floor, and this is what happened. Now, what's interesting about this building is the facade, as we saw earlier, beautiful Manitou redstone, but the inside of the building was all wood. And I have found through the ledgers all of the insurance rates and premiums that had to be forced onto the tenants because of the wood infrastructure, the insurance companies charged this exorbitant amount and the owners of the building pass some of those costs on to each tenant. And sadly, that whole interior just went up in one night. Now, when this went down, the city really, I mean, they were reeling after the flood and then to lose the opera house the next year. So what happened was, um, in this case, uh, there were three financial investors, and Marion and Della's father, they were actually the lead in creating the um, Southern Colorado Investment Company. And this company was directly created to rebuild the building that once stood on the opera house. Clearly, they weren't going to rebuild it in the same exact style, but they tried to do it in kind of a Sullivan-esque design. And of course, this is what you see now. And this, of course, has been abandoned for quite some time. This is the theater as it is today. It's a 1,200-seat theater, and it sits like that today. I've taken groups over there. Sadly, the building was under contract with an amazing developer just over the last three weeks and they decided to pull out because of the parking situation there. And if you have a 1,200 seat theater and there, there isn't the right parking, there's gonna be the right owner, I think, in the future. I really want to make sure we don't have, I mean, Pueblo had more movie houses per capita than any other city in the United States 
in the early 1900s, we had 92 movie theaters. 92. So this was vaudeville. This was talkies. All of those. Broadway. All those different things. So we have theaters now that are being used. People are living in them. Some are boarded up. Some are abandoned. This one is in relatively good shape. But it is something that we at the Pueblo Regional Film Commission, one of our pillars is, is to select and to actually work with the National Trust of Historic Preservation. They do have a special division that does historic movie houses. So this would be a wonderful, wonderful project if we get the right group to do that. But I was just amazed that Marion Knuckles was appointed vice president of this investment company to make sure that this building got rebuilt, and it did in 1926. So another thing that came out of nowhere, I have no idea that she was so extraordinary. So 1928, George Harvey dies. So George Harvey is Marion and Della's father, and he is the son of Emmett Knuckles who founded it. So I wanted to give you a little bit of context because this story gets really interesting. Just to think about 1928, what happened in 1928? Agatha Christie, she published The Mystery of the Blue Train. Stalin issued his first five-year plan. The Mercedes-Benz SSK is first produced. Kellogg's Rice Krispies uh, first appears on the market. Frida Kahlo joins the Mexican Communist Party. Enzo Ferrari establishes Scuderia Ferrari. Al Capone buys a 14-room mansion in Palm Island, Florida. The second Olympic Winter Games held in St. Moritz, Switzerland. St. Francis Dam failure in California. Ernest Hemingway moves to Key West. Amelia Earhart. I was really looking for what other women were happening. Where were women in this period? And there's a lot. But Amelia Earhart becomes first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Then the summer games are held in Amsterdam. Frank Lloyd Wright marries Oglivana Lazovich Hinzenberg. Alexander Fleming first discovers penicillin, which was amazing at that time. Franklin D. Roosevelt is elected the governor of New York State. Mickey Mouse appears in his first animated feature. Ernest Hemingway's father, Clarence, commits suicide and and President Calvin Coolidge signs the Boulder Canyon Project Act. And then I looked at what was the most significant event in 1928, other than Marion and Della being appointed president, vice president, and treasurer, but the 6.2 mile long Moffat Tunnel, which if you watch the flood documentary, this was the trade-off. And this is what changed the trajectory of rail transportation here in Pueblo when the route was rerouted and the Moffat Tunnel. So that was America's um, first, and it was the world's longest railway tunnel. That was also opened in 1928. So under the leadership of these sisters, and Marion was appointed president, and that was because Della still had quite a few interests in Broadway, and she really wanted to continue a lot of those uh, things that she was currently involved in. And so Marion took over president, Della took over vice president and treasurer. But what I find really extraordinary is at the outset, they created an employee salary savings plan, they created an employee life insurance plan, they created the credit union, and they really worked very hard to kind of deal with worker unionization. It's never an easy thing to do, but they really did understand, and in fact, um, in 1937, which is really one of the most powerful years of these two women, um, the chieftain reported that the union leader had lauded Marion Knuckles for fairness in dealing with labor and her acceptance of the worker unionization. That was April 15th, 1937. And 1937 was unique because it was the 47th anniversary of the Knuckles Packing Company. So this is another reason why I love Pueblo and the library. So in the special collections, third floor in special collections and genealogy, they actually have the original letters, the responses, and actual tickets for this open house. And 
I just have to read you one of the paragraphs um, at the end of this letter here. Uh, this is the letterhead, which has this beautiful etching. And this was the invitation, all signed by Marion Knuckles. But this is a response. And um, it, it's beautifully written. I mean, it's sad that, I don't know, we've, our, this digital age, we've lost the ability to, to type and handwrite letters. But um, it says, Dear Miss Knuckles, your letter of May 15th with invitation to attend your company's open house on Sunday, May 16th, was duly received. I regret it was impossible for me to attend this celebration, but I had to return to Denver early on Sunday. I assure you, nevertheless, I appreciate having received your kind invitation. Your company is to be congratulated on having rounded out 47 years of service to the people of Colorado and surrounding territory in an industry so essential to the welfare of the whole people. From a modest beginning, your company has established for itself a very enviable position in the trade territory of this section, and I wish for you continued success and prosperity. Sincerely yours, E.A. Bloomquist, 607 Beulah Avenue. And that was on May 17th, 1937. And the ticket for the raffle. <laughs> so at that same year, um, the Knuckles family really gave tribute to the generations before and to all of their workers. So Marion was the president. Here's Della up here, Della Knuckles. And then that is G.H., George Harvey, their father. So clearly, many years after he passed, they still gave tribute. And they did this every single year. Um, these are some of the big advertisements they did all throughout the country. Knuckles Packing Company, we are always in the market for good quality, well-finished hogs and cattle. 47 years of progress, deal direct with us. They had an amazing policy for how they dealt with uh, customers. So World War II was really an interesting period. Um, some of the photos, um, Marion made it a point, every single company picture. She was always in every company picture. She made sure. This is a smaller group. Um, some of the pictures have 400, 500 people out in front of the plant. But this is one of the trades. So they, they were literally um, an extraordinary organization distributing products from sugar beets to all of the meats to all of the lards. They had different types of baking lards and they had cooking lards. And um, they, they just, they had an extraordinary operation and their trade shows were very successful. But this article really going into World War II really just, puts it out there in numbers because it was such an amazing economic engine of Pueblo. So it was the second largest industry after the steel mill. And this was, this article was about um, the sisters giving an industrial speech before membership of the expansion committee of the Chamber of Commerce. In 1941, they purchased $2 million in local livestock. If you convert that today, that's $37,220,000. So $2 million of livestock. This was 1941. Um, they also showed, which I'm going to show um, just a, a part of it in the next slide, uh, a film called Meat and Romance. It was one of Alan Ladd's first films. And um, it's a 47-minute film, and I'll show you some pictures of it. But they did a premiere here in Pueblo. Della and Marion, of course, arts and entertainment was such a big deal. They got Hollywood to allow them to show this film in Pueblo as part of this. They were purchasing livestock, $40,000 a week. Their payroll was at a half a million dollars a year. This is 1941. There were 2,000 people that were directly dependent on this Knuckles operation. The sales territory was from Mississippi to the Pacific and from Utah to Mexico. And their goal, this was 1941, so just in a few, 
just in a few years, they wanted to double their sales to $4 million and hire 200 more employees. And this was in the uh, Pueblo Star Journal on February 18th, 1941. This is Meat and Romance, and you can get it on YouTube. It's hilarious. And I encourage everyone to watch it because I, I had no idea what to expect. I looked at the title, I'm thinking Meat and Romance. So it's really about this young housewife who gets advice on the variety of meat dishes that she can prepare for her husband's dinner. To make a long story short, there's really no spoiler alert, but Alan Ladd and his bride are in the house and um, the doorbell rings and it's the last day of their honeymoon. And the doorbell rings and it's, it's his father, who's a very world famous economist, and then his sister, who's also a world famous home economist. And she's terrified because she has nothing to cook. And so she says, oh, don't worry. And she, she takes her to the butcher shop. And they're watching all these people buy meat. And she says, you know, watch her buy that meat. That's a very popular cut. And the reason that that cut is so expensive is because everyone orders the same cut. And she goes, but I will tell you, you can ask for this cut and it'll be 60% less because no one knows that cut. And then the butcher is like, you really know your meat. So it's hysterical. You have to really watch it. I learned a lot about how to order my meat and what cuts. But, um, and um, you can get it on YouTube. But this is really fun. Well, this is funny too, because look at the ad here. Is your child a nose picker? <laughs> I had to leave that in there. <laughs> We're not going to talk about it, but it's pretty funny. Um, but this was really, really, it, it, it really showed how much the Pueblo community really cared about the Knuckles Packing Company. Not just the company, but the way that they treated their employees. So there were rumors before, when the war started, that they were going to have to shut the plant down, which they eventually did. But I was talking about that $4 million target that they were trying to reach. Well, they reached that in 1943. And that is, in today's dollars, $63 million. So think about how powerful that company was. But I read this, and I'm going to read just a little bit of it because boy, these women, I mean, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. You know, I mean, it's just extraordinary because, you know, we're coming out of COVID and it's probably the first time for many of us to be in a situation where the government is asking us, in many cases, requiring us to do certain, certain things. Well, World War II was a similar time where the government was requiring certain things of industry. But um, they were interviewing Miss Knuckles and Miss um, Knuckles, she added that she regretted the action very much because of her realization of the importance of the plant to Pueblo and livestock growers of this section of the country. The packing company has been operating under price ceilings for the past eight weeks, and due to current conditions, we just couldn't take it any longer, Miss Knuckles said. The closing of the plant will cover about a three-week period Miss Knuckles explained, no more livestock will be bought after this week, and that will mean about 100 employees will be released. Then the processing of the meat will take another three weeks before the complete operations are suspended. Miss Knuckles, reluctant to talk about this decision they have been forced to make, said that when it was announced to livestock men and others they showed their willingness to try to help in every way. The plant purchases approximately $4 million worth of livestock every year, and the growers will be the ones to suffer the most. And quote unquote, I want to help win this war and do everything in our power to comply with the wishes of the federal government, she said. But it is not possible to continue here under current conditions, which I regret very much. What's amazing at this time was it wasn't just um, the knuckles that were feeling the sentiment, but the Pueblo chieftain started a huge campaign 
to tell Washington, D.C. to keep their hands off of this plant. And this letter that I got from the Knuckles' grandchildren and great-grandchildren is from J.C. Hormel of the Hormel Meat Company. So if you know history, spam saved the world during World War II. But when I first got this letter, I didn't know the full context. And, and now, having studied it, it really is extraordinary because what J.C. Hormel did, um, and um, I know his grandson. He was the former ambassador to Luxembourg. Um, who recently passed away, and I knew him in San Francisco. But I really want to connect with the Hormel Foundation now, because what J.C. Hormel did in terms of his recommendations in this letter is really extraordinary and really saved Pueblo um, in this particular case. But um, in May 1942, the Knuckles Packing Company plant in Pueblo closed. And basically, it was World War II, we had the OPA price ceiling. So this was tin rationing, price controls, meat controls. Um, the chieftain campaigned Washington, D.C. to keep their hands off the plant. In April 1944, the plant is leased to Lincoln Packing for supplying the U.S. Army and also for consumers in Colorado, in New Mexico. But what I want to read to you, he gives these suggestions. He's really thoughtful, and I, it's amazing. It's Dear Della. I mean, it's like these two industry leaders talking about how they need to work together at a time that was very uncertain. But in the very bottom here, um, he says, and let me just, I have a bigger one so I can read it. He says, um, in short, then it would appear that there is not much opportunity to show profits during the wartime but there would appear to be a profit opportunity thereafter. And it would seem that if the local business is to be available later, it should be cultivated now, even though barely on a break-even basis. So he says, I'm leaving tomorrow for a trip east, because he was going to go to talk to uh, federal officials about all the rationing plans and everything. Um, and we'll be back on the 9th or the 10th, at which time I may have some further information, particularly on the impending revision in the tin order. Yours very truly, J.C. Hormel. So what he said there really was, you've got this extraordinary plant, and right now today, because of the situation, it's almost impossible. But if you can, and because the community was so willing to help out, if you could keep it going, you know, there will be extraordinary profits down the road. So that's where this gets really interesting. He really gave Della, you know, not only a reaffirmation, you know, as an industry leader, but it was, there was this whole sense of, you know, we're going to win the war. We've got to feed America. We've got to get your plant open. So American Stores, which was the parent company of Lincoln Packing, they actually purchased the plant on April 1st, 1945. V-Day was the next month in May of 1945, and then in 1946, American stores heavily invested in the Pueblo plant. Millions of dollars. They expanded the kill for, they built the Livestock Hotel. So from 1946 until 1971, when Alpha Beta came on board, they were the ones that really carried it forward. But it was really this advice, and Della being really the one who was um, at the helm at that time, um, really um, did a magnificent job in saving the, the business. Um, I'm, I didn't go into many of the husbands, but I'll just mention um, Francis Schwinger actually committed suicide, and it's a very amazing story. Um, which would be a whole other series of lectures, and also just his whole story. Um, but um, Marion went on and remarried. She moved out to San Jose just before the war, um, and sadly, at a very young age, she was only, she died in 1949, so she was only in her late 40s. Uh, she died of breast cancer. So, um, but I work with her grandson and her great-grandson. But Della, Della lived until 1980, and um, she went out west to California, and she lived on one of the most exclusive beachfront properties in La Jolla, California. 
uh, which recently sold for like $16 million, this piece of property. But what's really interesting is no matter where the sisters died and all of the family members died, they were all exhumed very quietly. Della was brought back to Roselawn. Marion, two years later after her death, she was brought back to Roselawn. They even exhumed Della's first husband, Alexander Jones, and brought him quietly to Pueblo. So if you go out to Roselawn, there's this massive knuckles plant. So I think it's only the first husbands that they brought with them. <laughs> I'm still going to have to study that a little bit. But um, uh, this letter, I have a whole series of letters. I mean, it's really amazing that, you know, these two women still in 1928, I think about what they were up against. Um, but they had an extraordinary sense of not only their own, I mean, I think it came from the performing arts. I mean, they were so extraordinary in dance and in music, but they also had this business sense, this prowess, and they really felt the need to really work together with the community, with the, you know, they were just huge community participants. Um, this is a very famous painting that Teresa Vito, one of our great local artists, she painted. But I have, and I'll ask Justin, it's just a two-minute um, instrumental, but this is from 1922, the Greenwich Village Follies, Della's first production that she performed in. And this is called um, 60 Seconds Every Minute I Think of You. From this is from the Library of Congress. They have such extraordinary things, and next year we'll be able to download them. But I'll let Justin, can you try that? Here we go, it's got the crackly sound. this film. Men, women, and children eat meat because they like it. It has been a major food of the human race from prehistoric times. This liking for meat has continued because meat tastes good and because it is satisfying. Only in recent years has it been fully realized that this predilection for meat was nature's means of assuring a supply of many essentials of an adequate diet. Meat has become the food around which most meals are planned. It is important, therefore, that the homemaker know how to select meat and how to cook it. In many homes, the head of the family takes pride in being able to carve and serve meat. And everyone is interested to know about the high nutritive value of meat. A great deal of new information on the subjects of the food value of meat and the meat cookery has been revealed through extensive research sponsored by the National Livestock and Meat Board. During the past several years, in order to make this knowledge available, the educational sound motion picture, Meat and Romance, was produced by the board in collaboration with the Bureau of Home Economics of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The major facts developed in the picture are recorded in this booklet. It is furnished for reference to those who have seen the film, but the information it contains is equally valuable to those who have not yet had the opportunity of seeing meat and romance on the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. This has been fun. <laughs> And if you're interested in what was going on with women in 1928, I have a printout globally, which is really extraordinary. But we did pretty good on the time. Are there any questions before we wrap it up? So what was happening during the 
try to use the mic just so that we can record it too. Yeah. So during the Depression, um, actually because at the beginning there was this need, um, they were able to work locally, regionally, and with the state. Um, but during the Depression, they actually worked very, very hard to try to keep the, because food is one of those essentials. And of course then, there were, they did hogs, they did sheep, and they also did cattle. So there were different ways that they could fluctuate that market. And it did fluctuate quite a bit because a lot of the luxuries that we were used to at those volumes just couldn't happen. But when I look at the ledgers, it was pretty consistent because it supplied such a huge territory. So there was a downturn during the Depression, but um, you know, it wasn't like the flood. It wasn't like those things that really just cut off everything. But it would be something that I'd like to look into more. Questions? If there's no, do you have a question? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the, if you didn't hear, the question was really about where there are some hurdles. You know, as a woman in 1928, were there people in the industry, were there people in the community that kind of served as, um, shall we say, roadblocks or difficult in, in their particular, you know, business enterprise? What was interesting is they were brought up in such a unique way in the community. They were very public. And in fact, when I look at Marion and Della, um, even though they were married and they were um, divorced or widowed or, well, widowed basically, <laughs> whether it's suicide or whether they die, but um, the manner in which you refer to women. So they were able to keep oftentimes the Knuckles name and it's very interesting how they would continue to use Miss because I think if they used misses, they didn't use misses until, and this is something I really want to study more, um, because if you were widowed, you know, oftentimes the women sometimes would take on the husband's name, but they always kept the knuckles name. But in some documents you could find them all. But in terms of the way that they interacted with the community, um, you know, they were extraordinary in how they, their community outreach. Um, the fact that they, there was, shall we say, just maybe white privilege in their family because they had a lot of money. They were able to establish these investment companies like the Southern Colorado Investment Company was started by these three very wealthy men and they appointed Marion to be the vice president. She was very capable, but there was a lot of privilege also, I think, that comes with that. I'm learning in that book you know, of how this very kind of royal blue blood family that came over. But once you hit America and you hit the plains and you hit, you know, the Rocky Mountains and you were in that kind of frontier, you know, from Leadville all the way down, um, there's a hardening, I think, of a lot of those individuals, men and women alike. But um, I would love to study more about the management below the women because, you know, those are the people that are on the front line. And yes, they were very influential in promoting a lot of these programs, like the salary savings plan, the insurance plan, the credit union. I mean, those were amazing. We don't even do that today in some cases. So I would love to study a little bit more about those particular, um, say, middle management individuals and what kind of relations they did have. Because I would imagine that there were still, you know, many, I mean, just reading Meat and Romance, I mean, you know, the homemaker had to make, and the, the head of the household got to carve. I mean, there were pretty solid rules. But um, one thing I have learned in working with research about the meatpacking plant in particular, and I don't think it's just unique to the meatpacking plant, is always talk to the workers. Management will deny everything that happened in the plant, but the workers will tell you everything. So I'm sure there's something that we can learn from that, because I don't think it's all rosy. I mean, I, I, I can't believe that. Um, there had to have been some struggles and some hurdles. But what they did do 
as individual women, you know, just in terms of their own growth and development. I mean, going out and being an aesthetic contemporary dancer with a dentist on, with Martha Graham, I mean, and then traveling the United States and doing Broadway shows. And so, I mean, that was hard business to begin with. But um, so I would like to study that more because I don't think it was as equitable. You know, they were very privileged at that level. Make sure that's. So in terms of Marion and Della, what they, yes. did, what they did? Well, they were actually very active in the community. And when I read those particular, when I read the papers, um, almost every paper, there's listings of all of the women in the community that were very, very active. Oftentimes, it was very much attached with the arts, is what I've noticed. When I looked, I'm trying to dig a little bit more to see what other women might have been in leadership roles you know, that's just so, I mean, they were the first in the United States to be in those high level executive positions. I would like to see more about, because a steel town already conjures up some pretty hard kind of, you know, descriptions of what life was like, you know, in terms of the work that was done in the mines and the mills. Um, and in the meatpacking was a great job. I mean, it paid in cash, it was good paying on Fridays, it was a tough job oftentimes dangerous. Now, the Knuckles family, they prided themselves for three generations for over 60 years. It was the safest meatpacking plant. That was the world's largest when it was built in 1917. But they were very proud that worker safety was a priority there. They had some problems from 1946 until 1971. And even from 71, when Alpha Beta had it, there are going to be, I mean, it's dark, it's cold, and it's not sometimes a healthy environment for workers. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Kind of? <laughs> yeah. Where, where did they live in town? So it's a good question. Where did they live? So you can go to their house. So if you, they lived at 38 Carlisle. It's the Took Carlisle. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. So if you cross the 4th Street Bridge, and you know where the pawn shop is right there? You can turn, pawn shop. You can turn right, make a right there. I don't know the name of that street, but it goes in and it hits Carlisle, because Carl then crossed over. But it's right at the bend. It's a beautiful old home. And then George Harvey Knuckles, Marion and Della's father, they built the beautiful Beulah cabin, which when you go to Beulah, where the road splits, if you go left, just on your left-hand side is this gorgeous, beautiful, all craftsman style, um, that was the number one kind of cabin, shall we say. It's about 5,000 square feet on about 10 acres. It just recently sold for about $500,000. It's a beautiful property. Yeah, no, beautiful property. Yeah. Huh? That's not much. Well, not what they're selling for now. No. Oh, you mean back then. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Just briefly. Yeah. Sure. Well, it's interesting because when I came to Pueblo, I came to open up a network of healthcare clinics, but I worked on a meatpacking plant in Berlin and Shanghai. So when I got to town, I immediately knew who the architect was, Hans Peter Henschen, Norwegian. But I didn't know that that was the first of 300 that he built around the world. So Hans Peter Henschen and Henry Ford were of the school of the rational factory. And if you've seen my butcher coat, it says Rational Factory, Gregory Howell, because the Rational Factory is about people, processes, and successful outcomes. Henry Ford was the same way, automobile automation. He just, it was, it was really about lowering your labor costs. Meatpacking was the same way. It just wasn't assembly line for car production. So the building was built four stories, and in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was determined that animals could march up four flights without injuring themselves. So all meatpacking plants around the world, the kill floors are always on the fourth floor. And so gravity was the main form of technological innovation. Now this plant is unique because it's a quarter of a million square feet, no load-bearing walls, and six inches of cork goes from the basement all the way to the rooftop. And if you know Pueblo weather, 
which can fluctuate 40, 50 degrees in one day, that building never fluctuates more than 15 degrees because of the natural insulation that cork provides. And we've tested that cork, and it's all animal and plant-based. No asbestos, there's no other. So we're very, very fortunate with that. But the building is all built with a cluster design. So with no load-bearing walls, you could shift up your production because they constantly were improving and upgrading. Because if you look at over 100 years, meatpacking changed a great deal. So as far as the design, the one thing that I really love is he's world famous for not only the brick facades, but with all of that Art Deco, early Art Nouveau, kind of mid-century modern, the geometric designs. You don't need to do that for a meatpacking plant. I mean, you go to the steel mill, you kind of know what you're going to get into. But it, my theory is he just wanted to, everyone to think they were going to a nice office building. <laughs> Clearly, it wasn't on the inside. But boy, the integrity of that building is extraordinary. It was the epicenter of the flood, and that's why it survived. And that's why the Knuckles family, the Red Cross, and the Elks Lodge got that building up and running in 60, less than 60 days for the ground zero for the recovery. Because food distribution was huge. It was the rail that was really problematic because so much of the rail was destroyed. But that's really the big part of that design, Hans Peter Henschen. And he built 300 around the world. So that's why we're talking with the Norwegian government now to help them fund an endowment and create a little museum because he was pretty extraordinary. And when you see how the plant actually worked, we're just doing the same thing. We're just not, um, we're not uh, making meat or processing meat or slaughtering. Uh, we're just kind of, we're on the arc of ideation. So everything's about ideas now. So any other questions? Yes. So did Marion or Gemma have children? So yes, they did. Um, well, um, Della did not. As far as I know, Della did not. Now, she married into families that had children. Um, Marion has a really interesting story. She did have children in San Jose. But part of this very, very complex story, and it's still unknown, and I'm still working with the family because the family doesn't know exactly how this child appeared. So Frances Swinger had a son from a previous marriage. We don't know because Marion and Frances were doing a lot together for many years there. And they eventually married in 1933. So one of the stories is this was a child out of that marriage because she adopted the son. And so we think, well, uh, does that mean that it was hers or it wasn't? There's a lot of questions there. But that son um, then had children. I mean, it's funny because even the family to this day, they don't know the full story. They're trying to figure it all out. And even um, John Corber, who is Pueblo's really amazing historian, who I just, I mean, a lot of my talk today is based on some of his research. But he even has a disclaimer when he was following all the marriage certificates, the birth certificates, the adoptions. He's saying... The writer could not determine whose child was who and where. So there is still a lot of uncertainty there. But, um, yeah. Right. But I'd like to find out what you find out about that. No, and, and the sad thing is a lot of things, you know, again, with documents in Pueblo, you know, there's pre-flood and there's post-flood, you know. Um, but um, amazingly, a lot of the documents you can get that have been digitized, you know, were documents that weren't in Pueblo at the time. And they have now been digitized. So you can get online databases and you can find out of Denver's public library system, out of the Library of Congress. Um, but Pueblo has this really interesting especially with official city documents, because many of them were destroyed during the flood. And so um, that's why when you try to go back and get plans of houses and permits and all of that, sometimes you just can't get those. So unless the design was done like Louis Sullivan did the Opera House or like Hans Peter Henschen, we have found those plans at other universities because their headquarters were elsewhere than Pueblo, and so we're able to get those now. And many of them were having them digitized, which will be great, because then more people will have access to them. So, 
Yes. So the sisters, uh, what I would recommend you do, and I tell everyone, is if you go to the third floor at the library, Special Collections, ask for the John Corber files. John Corber was amazing, and there's about 200 binders on all of the great Pueblo stories, and he's like a CSI investigator. He literally goes in, and he finds birth certificates, death certificates, marriage, he finds everything. And they're big binders, you can't check them out, but you can go in and you can photo you take your camera and you can photograph them. But that's where I would go to start. I'm starting to get a lot of requests because the more I tell the story, people are just fascinated. And we have filmmakers now that are interested in doing some type of a presentation, you know, whether it be a full feature or documentary or something along those lines. So um, I'm just gonna continue to do research. But if there's something in particular that you're looking for, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I can help direct you. Because sometimes it's tricky. Um, but I go online. Library of Congress is amazing. And um, one thing that I hope that they'll be able to do, which it's just going to be an issue of funding, is all of the chieftains have not been digitized. And so, and if you read some of the great chieftain writers of the 1920s and 30s and 40s, they were writing like Pulitzer Prize winning writers. I mean, it, really great reporting. So you can dig into a lot of those. You can go to the library and you can get the actual big old papers. You can go through them. And, but I would love it once they're digitized, then everyone will have access to those. Um, I have not started to dig into that yet. It's not like the steel mill because of the Ludlow massacre. There's amazing documentation because that changed labor law in the world. So there you can get a lot of information. But as far as the knuckles, um, that's on my list. So if you want to research that together, I'd be more than happy to start looking at it for you. If there aren't any more questions, thank you so much. And then next week will be the last session of the dig. Um, and I'm really excited because we have some big, I'm going to be making the announcement about Reagan Foster who is the CSUP professor of journalism. Uh, she's gonna be speaking on um, news as a community asset, digging deeper. And we have a big announcement and um, there will be a giveaway to everyone. And also we're gonna do the two drawings uh, for the season tickets for next year. So that'll be fun. But um, it, it's big news and we're really excited. We actually finished all the paperwork yesterday. so. We're really excited. So whether you're here next week or not, um, you'll be in one of the drawings. Um, but if you're present, um, you'll also have another chance to win those tickets and hear the great news. But it'll be um, on uh, YouTube also. So thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks.